Well, good afternoon, greetings, and welcome to our inaugural panel in our virtual webinar series, Policy Implications and Recommendations to Promote Healthier Outcomes for People Living with HIV in the Southern US. Today's panel focuses on the state of PEP and PrEP policy in the South. I am Aisha Standifer, Director of Population Health at the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. At Morehouse School of Medicine, our vision is to be leading the creation and advancement of health equity. At the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, our mission aims to lead and be the transformational force for health equity in policy, leadership, development, and research. We are rooted in the legacy of our founder, the 16th US Surgeon General, Dr. David Satcher. And our mission, again, is to create systemic change at the intersection of policy and equity by focusing on three priority areas, the political determinants of health, health systems transformation, and mental and behavioral health. In conjunction with key partners, SHLI enhances leadership among diverse learners, conducts forward thinking research on the drivers of health inequities, and advances evidence-based policies in an effort to contribute to the achievement of health equity for all populations and groups. More specifically, our Institute has aligned forces today, especially with Gilead Sciences, with the Advancing Health and Black Equity Initiative. This focuses on ending the epidemic of people living with HIV in the Southern US with inclusive partners, including Xavier University, other academic institutions, and the community at large. This initiative addresses HIV in the Southern US where more than 52% of diagnoses occur and disproportionately impact black and brown LGBTQ plus communities. These partnerships that we're going to highlight today build and strengthen strategic community-driven approaches toward dismantling systemic barriers that prevent people in vulnerable communities, urban and rural, from accessing quality HIV treatment and testing. Through this investment initiative, we are zeroing in on health equities and advancing organizations that help build progress in strengthening public health infrastructure, addressing HIV-related stigma, and providing important resources to under-resourced populations. Thank you for joining us. Now let me turn it over to Elias Berhanu. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the Ending the Epidemic Project is hosting quarterly webinars featuring important topics, highly dynamic speakers, and highlighting health equity for people living with HIV. Both PrEP and PEP are extremely effective and vital in fighting to end HIV epidemic. Today, we will hear from our featured speakers about the differences between PrEP and PEP, how equitable access will benefit those most effective, and last but not least, identify call, or identi identify calls to action for stakeholders, both statewide and federally. Our panelists will present. Then we look forward to op opening the moderated session um, for our virtual audience. So please utilize the Q&A function on your Zoom or the chat if you feel more comfortable. Our next quarterly webinar will take place on Wednesday, August 16th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we will co-host it with our um, aforementioned counterparts at Xavier University. More details to come, so save the date. I will now pass it on to our moderator, Ms. Sarah. Thank you, Elias. Um, again, my name is Sarah Houston. I'm the director of the Lincoln Commission on Human Rights and a policy advisor at the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, and I'll be moderating today's session. Today, we have three panelists. Uh, Nicole Robach, Executive Director of Aid Atlanta, Justin C. Smith, Director of the Campaign to End AIDS at Positive Impact Health Centers, and Leisha McKinley-Beach, Chief Executive Officer of the Black Public Health Academy. As Elias mentioned, each of our expert panelists will begin by offering a brief presentation and will respond to a few questions afterwards. At the end, we're gonna open up to questions from all of you using the Q&A function. So let's begin with uh, Ms. Nicole Roba. I'll hand the spotlight to you. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me um, as a part of this panel. Um, I don't have any presentation slides, so we'll just get into it when we get to the question um, question portion of the um, webinar. Thank you for having me. I, I hope that what I can share will be beneficial to those watching. All right. Now, you're the leader of a comprehensive HIV AIDS prevention treatment provider. So what types of barriers do people living with HIV AIDS face before coming to your organization when they're trying to access testing and treatment? I think there's several barriers, uh, many of which we've probably heard over and over again. I think the number one um, barrier continues to be stigma and fear, um, a fear of even coming into a health center or wellness center to, to be tested for HIV. Um, I think we all can't underestimate the, um, the bravery, the courage it takes to walk into um, uh, healthcare, healthcare center, center. Wellness center and um, request an HIV test because um, people automatically feel that they're going to be judged, you know, just me, just based on making that decision. Um, I also think there's uh, tangible issues such as transportation, such as lack of um, access or um, the, the funds, you know, to, to access healthcare. Uh, poverty is a huge issue in the South. I don't think that there's, uh, um, it's, it's surprising that where you see a huge concentration of poverty that you will see health disparities. Uh, HIV just happens to be another one of those. Uh, also in terms of lack, lack of um, employment, um, you know, all of the things that comes with uh, impoverished um, communities and communities at most risk and at disparate health outcomes. I think that's where HIV breeds. So um, those are uh, several of the factors that come to mind immediately in terms of what people um, come into our uh, respective buildings um, when they're either coming for HIV testing, for STD, STD testing and um, or HIV treatment or STD treatment. Now, in addition to the work that um, that you do, you're also serving on a variety of committees, including housing for people living with HIV AIDS advisory committee. Um, what can you tell us about the housing barriers people living with HIV AIDS face and what work is being done to alleviate that enormous burden of costly unsafe housing? Yeah, housing is a, is probably the number one um, uh, need that our at least our members come into um, services in need of uh, lack of um, affordable income based housing in uh, Georgia in the Atlanta area is is a huge problem, and so if you think about if someone isn't stably housed, right? They're, the last thing that they're going to be thinking about is my medical appointment. Did I swallow my pills today? Um, those are issues across the spectrum of not only people who are HIV positive, but those who are most at risk for HIV, um, contracting HIV. So even those that come in for HIV testing, you know, the HIV negative, um, they too are at the same types of risk in terms, they come with the same issues in terms of housing instability. So um, I've been serving, I created a, um, basically a community housing group after just feeling like um, we can do this, you know, ourselves, we have the answers within the community we can um, we can begin to resolve some of these issues. So we did a lot of um, um, advocacy with the city of Atlanta that happens to run the HAPWA program. And you know, I, I would say that as a result of that joint effort that we have seen drastic improvements in those programs and services on the ground. But the other thing to, to know is that HAPWA um, actually housing opportunities for people living with HIV and AIDS, that's a federal grant. 
funding that comes to jurisdictions uh, most impacted by HIV. Atlanta is about is has already taken a 60% hit to, to the funding. So what that equals in terms of um, services that's going to be available on the ground will be a huge uh, disaster for the people that we serve. So housing is a huge issue. It's a huge crisis. Um, we have to be out there advocating for better rent control, for affordability of housing. And we also have to make sure that people with HIV have a seat at the table when there are larger Atlanta uh, plans around affordability of housing. We just want to make sure that we have a seat at the table and our voice is known and our the, the needs of our members are, are known. So it's a huge issue um, in terms of adherence to care, you know, um, continuing to access those the services. Because like I said, if you don't have access to, you know, your basic housing, food, those things, um, you know, it's gonna be hard for people to remain and stay in care. Absolutely. With the recent court decisions and attempts to restrict access to preventative services that have been going on, um, I, I know there's a renewed push uh, for a national PrEP program. What would that look like? Um, do you have any thoughts as to how close we are to making that happen? And do you have any concerns that uh, come to mind about what the rollout might look like? Uh, I, I think that what needs to happen is that PrEP needs to get the same kind of attention in terms of um, federal funds that, that um, HIV care does and that prevention care does. Uh, PrEP is a clearly um, highly effective biomedical uh, intervention that clearly works. However, the issue again is access. So if I don't have access to this fabulous um, technology in terms of access to medications, access to the actual care, because it's beyond just getting the medication, you have to have the ongoing care that comes, medical care that comes with the PrEP intervention. And if you don't have insurance, you don't have the, if organizations don't have funds to provide free PrEP services, um, you know, there's a, there's a gap in terms of being able to really provide those services. So I don't know what a national PrEP program might look like, um, but if it looks like everyone has the opportunity to get access to PrEP, then I'll, I'm all for it. Can you give us a little bit of an insight on the financial burden associated with PrEP and PEP? Um, and does that really differ significantly for individuals depending um, the, on their insurance status or their ability to access resources within the community? Absolutely, it's, it's a definitely uh, a game changer in terms of access to insurance. So one of the things we do here is we try to ensure that people um, access the Affordable Care Act plans. Um, so not only for HIV positive people, but for people coming through the doors for uh, ongoing PrEP services um, that they try to access um, the Affordable Care Act if they don't have access to insurance, they don't have a job or whatever the case may be. So um, accessing insurance is a game changer. It's a game changer for HIV positive people who might be only relying on a Ryan White program. If, if they broke, break their leg or you know, have cancer, they, they can't go to Ryan White to, to get those um, services, services, those medical services. So in terms of um, in terms of the burden of PrEP, like I said, there's no grant funding from the federal level for PrEP, but every everybody wants people to do PrEP. Um, so we, in terms of burden, for example, um, labs cost probably the first initial lab visit for PrEP here, because that might be different at different organizations based on their lab or, you know, or quest or relationships um, with laboratory services. PrEP at 8 Atlanta costs about $126 for an initial visit and then $63 every, every three months, right, to continue to see the doctor, monitor your labs, ensure that everything is working with your kidneys and your liver, 
So if you look at that um, formula, that's about $315. Sounds like a very small amount, right? A very small amount of money to help somebody stay um, um, HIV negative. Um, the, the medications through the PAP program, pharmaceutical assistance programs are free. Free pretty much for those who don't have insurance. You go through some hoops, yes, but for the most part, free. So you're looking at $315, $315 a year for somebody to remain on PrEP. Multiply that by a thousand people, $315,000 a year. I don't know what agency has that money in their back pocket um, just available to serve folk, but that's kind of the financial burden. And if we were, we, we actually do it for free here, but if we were to charge, that would be the amount of money that people would be paying. And I know there are organizations that do charge because of that burden. They have to pay for their providers. They have to pay for their overhead, pay for somebody to answer the phones, you know, make appointments. So there is a financial burden. And, you know, I, I'm waiting for the day when there can be some um, true funding um, dedicated to PrEP because clearly it works, clearly works. Thank you very much, Ms. Roebuck. You're welcome. I will now hand the microphone of sorts over to Justin C. Smith. Thanks so much, Sarah. And it's always hard to follow Nicole, but I'll do my job. <laughs> um, my name is Justin Smith. I use he, him pronouns, and I currently serve as the director of the Campaign to End AIDS at Positive Impact Health Centers, which is a comprehensive HIV service organization based here in Atlanta. I also wear a couple other hats that are relevant to the conversation. Um, I serve as the co-chair of the Stigma and Disparities Subcommittee of the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS or PASHA, which helps to advise the federal response to HIV on a national level. Um, I also serve as one of the uh, tri-chairs of the Health Subcommittee of the Atlanta Mayor's LGBTQ Advisory Board. Um, so we have an interest in this conversation from that lens. And I'm also a proud member of the Prep, Prep and Black America Collective. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So I wanna begin with just um, a few, like literally two slides. So let me just see if I can get my technology working. But while I'm putting that up, um, just for some grounding, um, CDC uh, released some data last week about where we are in the HIV epidemic. Um, and I think that's just important context to sort of shape where we go for the rest of our time here today. And the top line story is actually pretty good. Um, I think the, uh, the top line is really that we've had a decline in the number of new HIV diagnoses. Um, about a 12% decline measured between 2017 and 2021. Uh, and so that sounds good, but I think what happens when you dig into the data is that you see a lot of the same uh, racial inequities that we're so kind of used to seeing, but also sick of seeing um, kind of uh, replicated in that data. So um, let me see if I can get this working. Okay, um, can someone just confirm that this is in uh, full screen mode for folks that are viewing? Yes. I yes. Think? Okay, great. So just to kind of walk you through uh, the slide, um, again, the top line story is that uh, we've had this sort of uh, significant decline in the number of new HIV diagnoses um, between 2017 and uh, 2021. So that's great. But what you notice is that when you look at this graph, um, you sort of see where that uh, kind of breaks out. And I just want to, um, it's most pronounced in this graph um, among gay and bisexual men, um, but it's really pronounced across all sort of uh, disease categories, right? So, or excuse me, transmission categories, where you see for every uh, kind of population, with the exception of people who inject drugs, um, it is Black people that are bearing the uh, greatest burden of HIV. And even though we've seen that decline, that still remains to be true. And so that's really where we have to put a lot of our efforts. And we cannot begin to have a conversation about addressing HIV without first centering equity, right? Because a lot of what we have to do is address the inequity that we see that shows up in the data. So 
that's sort of top line. Um, you know, this is data that's not unfamiliar to most folks in this space. Um, but I think most important for the conversation that we're having today about, uh, about PrEP, this, I think, is really uh, the data that we most want to sort of ground ourselves in. And um, what you'll notice here, again, is you see the replication of these uh, racial inequities um, in PrEP coverage, right? Um, so there's some really smart people over at Emory that developed this measure, um, what they call a PrEP to need ratio. And uh, by using this information, we can kind of get a sense for what proportion of a population that could benefit from PrEP is currently using it, right? Uh, and what you'll notice in this graph is that while almost 80% of white people that could benefit from PrEP are currently uh, prescribed PrEP, only 21% of uh, Latino folks are prescribed PrEP, and then only 11% of Black people that could benefit from PrEP are currently uh, prescribed PrEP, right? So that's the gap that we have to sort of address. The gap between nearly 80% and just over 10%, right? Um, and so when we talk about uh, the promise of new biomedical tools, they get dropped into this system that without sort of any intentional action, it replicates inequity, right? And we have to figure out a better way to uh, kind of address that. Otherwise, we'll continue to be in a situation where the benefits of the incredible advances, and I, I want to be super clear that the fact that PrEP exists, uh, it, and that's actually what we see is driving some of, uh, one of the things that we know is driving this decline in new HIV uh, diagnoses is the uptake of PrEP, right? So this is a game changer, but it can't have its full promise if the people that we see based in the data that have the greatest burden of uh, HIV are not accessing this incredible tool. So that's really the work that we have uh, for all of us in this space and all of us that are concerned about trying to bring about an end to the HIV epidemic in the United States. Um, so I just wanted to kind of start out by grounding us in that space. Um, I'll stop sharing and I'll turn the floor back over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so talked about the disparities. What common misconceptions do you see regarding PrEP and PEP use? So I think um, one of the most common misconceptions is that PrEP is only for certain people, right? So, um, and specifically that it's only for gay men. Um, and, you know, I, I think in some ways, a lot of that has to do with in the United States, how PrEP was initially marketed. Um, you know, given that the uh, majority of new HIV cases occur in gay men, it makes sense that that would be the place that folks would have gone to first. But what we've done as sort of an unfortunate, unintended consequence of that focus is that it makes other people that can benefit from PrEP, um, primarily uh, cisgender heterosexual women, feel like this isn't something that's for them, right? And so thanks to the efforts of folks like Leisha and Nicole, you know, there really is this ongoing effort to really try to reach out to women, specifically Black women, about the benefits of PrEP, right? And so there's active work that's being, ha that's happening to try to make sure that you know, um, there are lots of people that can benefit from the use of PrEP who are not uh, gay or bisexual men, who should also, you know, uh, consider having PrEP as an option for their prevention. The second misconception that we hear commonly is that um, PrEP is expensive. And so it is true that if you were to look at the retail cost of the drug, it is very expensive, right? But Truth be told, most people don't actually pay that, right? So the good news is that um, unless this uh, case that uh, is currently being argued um, goes uh, the wrong way, the Braidwood versus Becerra uh, conversation, um, that would undermine not just uh, access to PrEP, but really uh, the whole panoply of preventive services that are currently covered under, under the Affordable Care Act uh, would be put at risk. And so, um, this is really uh, a threat, not just to PrEP access, uh, but really to all of preventive care. So like, you know, people won't get, be able to get PrEP, but they also can't get their statins, right? So it, it really has uh, some potentially uh, very devastating consequences. Um, 
But as it currently stands, because PrEP has what's called a grade A rating from the US Preventive Task Force, that means that it has to be, uh, if you have health insurance, it has to be covered without any uh, charge to the user. So, uh, so if you have health insurance, the, it should be that you don't pay anything for PrEP, right? Um, it's a little different if you are someone who's uninsured or underinsured, but there are lots of different programs and many of the HIV service organizations that exist within communities have ways of paying for PrEP such that it shouldn't be a large financial burden on people coming in to receive it, right? So, um, so those are kind of the two most common misconceptions that it's only for certain people um, and that it's expensive. Um, the other thing that I would say is that uh, this perception is also held by some healthcare providers. Um, but we hear um, a lot, particularly from women who might be interested in uh, getting PrEP, if they go to their doctor, their doctor will be like, well, I don't know, why, why would you need that, right? Uh, and so I think we have to educate both the community and healthcare providers about, you know, um, and basically the, the thing with PrEP is that if you are someone who is sexually active, um, it might be an option for you, right? It's worth having that conversation with your doctor to see if PrEP is an option that makes sense for you, full stop. Now you've already touched on this, um, but can you elaborate a little bit more on some of the barriers to access and utilization of PrEP and PEP, specifically to uh, barriers impacting Black people from using PrEP and PEP? Sure. So I think, you know, uh, the, the first barrier that Black people face in any situation is dealing with racism. So I think, uh, and racism certainly has a way of making its way into sort of every interaction. So we just have to make sure we, we name that up front. Um, but we would know in a more kind of proximal level is uh, the difference in levels of insurance access. Like, as I mentioned earlier, if you have health insurance um, and, you know, you live in a state that has Medicaid expansion and all types of other, you know, programs, there are lots of ways that you can get PrEP covered such that the cost no longer becomes a barrier, right? But what we know is that, you know, out in the land of milk and honey in California, um, you know, where they have pretty much everything that you would want, you, they have Medicaid expansion, they have sort of um, a dedicated uh, PrEP assistance program that's funded through state dollars. We still see the very same uh, racial inequities and PrEP access that we see here in Georgia, which doesn't have any of that, right? And so what that says to me is that there's something else going on that isn't just about the cost of the medication, right? And so I think part of it is like what kinds of systems of care exist within Black communities that are offering PrEP uh, and how kind of robust and strong are those institutions and those services, and right? And so I think that's something we have to examine. Um, you know, just the fact of having health insurance doesn't necessarily mean that you will utilize it. It also has to be something that is um, accessible, right? So if, you know, we know here in Atlanta, our transportation issues are pretty uh, legion. So you might have a provider who is very far away from you who might offer PrEP, um, but, you know, you may not have a good way to get there. Um, you may not be able to take the time off of work to go get it. Um, I think, you know, just in a very simple way, while PrEP is certainly uh, can be a really important uh, intervention to engage in to protect your health. It's not in the same way as it is for, for someone who's living with HIV where the medication is a necessity, right? Uh, and because it doesn't rise to the same level of medical necessity, if it's not easy to do, people won't do it, right? And that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, and so I think Part of the issue is that the system that we have that delivers PrEP is too complicated for a lot of people to navigate. And especially if it's not something that um, people will necessarily do a lot to get. Like if it's easy to just go to your doctor and say, hey doc, I want that script for PrEP, cool, people will do it, right? If it's something that you hear is normative within your community, people will make might step up. Again, you know, that conversation I talked about with uh, particularly cisgender heterosexual women, it's just not something people talk about, right? It's not a norm. And I think, again, people like Leisha are really working hard to kind of change that. So, um, but really it comes down to insurance status and sort of how accessible is that even from the sense of physical proximity and also what is the kind of cultural norm around uh, using PrEP within the community that you're a part of. 
Thank you. I think we'll now move to our third panelist, Leisha McKinley Beach. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, just a few housekeeping things for me in my five minutes. Number one, I don't have access to emojis and I didn't want you to think that I was having a spasm or something with everything that Nicole and Justin said. So this is my old school emoji for I'm agreeing, I'm agreeing. Um, and <laughs> also, to the audience, they took time to be with us today. Unfortunately, I can't respond in the chat to everyone, but I'm gonna ask everyone in the chat to respond to me. I'd love to know uh, who's on with us, where you are from, so that uh, my few comments, which will be few, because Justin and Nicole has covered 99% of everything, but I just want to make sure that we're capturing um, content that can benefit you. So those are my church announcements. Now, I'm Leisha McKinley Beach, and just really um, honored to be here when I saw the invitation for this uh, webinar and I saw the panelists, I thought this was an amazing opportunity to really show how Georgia is connecting the dots uh, with PrEP and PEP and its impact on the Southeast. Uh, and a lot of those leaders, Black leaders come from this house uh, in, in Atlanta. Uh, I recently started uh, a program or organization, um, the Black Public Health Academy. And it was something I've always wanted to do, but became more urgent. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the uh, Prep in Black America report. But one of the recommendations that came out of that report was really motivating uh, our Black public health workforce to respond to HIV and PrEP. And in order for us to see that type of impact, the for us, by us, we have to have folks who are in key decision-making positions. When you look at any of our health departments across the Southeast, you will clearly see an over-representation of Black employees and positions like disease intervention specialists, outreach workers, health educators, but you see few, very few uh, Black employees in positions as administrator, um, as the executive leader, as the director, as the manager, um, as the Surgeon General uh, for state and local health departments. And so this is going to be my contribution um, for PrEP, not just PrEP scale up, but overall health equity and uh, helping to support and mentor and coach those individuals who want to advance to those uh, uh, decision-making positions. Uh, a few years ago, we started a coalition called the Atlanta Black Women Leaders on PrEP uh, for many of the reasons that Justin and Nicole already identified. Right? Uh, we saw these huge disparities of, of PrEP among Black people across the board, whether we're talking about same gender loving men, people of trans experience, cisgender women, um, the data you just saw told our story. But when we look at HIV diagnoses among cisgender women across the Southeast, you can pick a state, any state, you see an overwhelming representation of black women. And so what are we doing to address those concerns? And what do we have power and influence over to have an impact? So we created this coalition of black women um, to address some of those issues in Atlanta. What was very interesting or what is very interesting is that even with our name, the Atlanta Black Women Leaders on PrEP, we have women who have convened with us 
from other states and jurisdictions of uh, DC and North Carolina and California, because they were looking for that same space as well um, to talk about some of the frustrations and challenges, again, already been stated around what the media and marketing looks like. Uh, about the dissemination of information so that women would know about these patient assistance uh, programs. Where can women go and access PrEP? Uh, and when we say free or at no cost, that it literally is just that. Uh, and so this group has been convening. And then the last thing I wanna say before we uh, get to the questions, uh, Justin touched on this as well about the PrEP in Black America convening. Um, this uh, group, uh, an amazing group of 10 people just completed now the second summit in a Southern city um, got together because it's not enough for us to just talk about it amongst ourselves. We raise awareness, right? We do a fantastic job of identifying the challenges and the barriers, but what are the solutions, right? And what can we contribute uh, to, to implementing those solutions? And so these two summits have given us great insight uh, in terms of uh, what the people are saying that we need and what we can advocate and be champions for, even with the national prep program to ensure black people don't get left behind okay, um, in these advances and resources that are coming our way. Thank you. One question for you, how did the COVID-19 pandemic really impact the pursuit of HIV policy and PrEP and PEP equity? Um, I think the one thing that COVID did for us was really pull the covers off of what many of us already know, right? That the underlying roots, the foundation of these poor health outcomes stems from racism, including racism in public health. I um, mean, I always want to uplift that because these are the systems that are supposed to be designing the healthcare services and outcomes uh, for all people, and they keep failing Black communities. So we saw um, racism um, in public health, and we also saw um, a term that we have used as a really nice package to say that there are social determinants, they have been here, um, that are impacting health outcomes for uh, communities, communities of color, communities in the South, and Black communities specifically all along. Uh, and we also, one thing that COVID also did for us is to show that when there was a crisis that didn't just affect minority communities, but affected the general population as a whole, we were quick to implement policies. We were quick to provide funding that's going to turn the tide from these negative health outcomes. Um, we were quick to implement procedures that benefit the masses. So you can't tell me anymore, all of this takes time, we don't have the money. COVID wasn't in anybody's 2019 budget because it didn't exist, but we found the money to address a health issue because it impacted the masses. Thank you. Um, I think at this time,
if we're ready for a general Q and A, I can I can hit us with the first one. Can, so um, we just you received. Guys see me? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Okay, because my my screen just went black. So oh. I apologize. I'm going to have to try logging out and logging back in because all I see is a black screen at this moment. Okay, so I'll go ahead and put in the first Q and A that uh, was asked. So. Uh, we have one that says, I appreciate Mr. Justin Smith's breakdown of PrEP uptake by race and ethnicity. I'm curious about why we see such a disparity in uptake among Black and Latinos. While it's clear that there are structural and systemic barriers and inequities for people of color, uh, going to subject to the structural and systemic barriers, I'm curious about the potential sociocultural factors. What do we know about attitudes and perceptions? perceptions towards prep for men of color that was asked during Justin's presentation but anyone feel free to jump in I'll start um so I've done some work on this myself um and you know some of the things that we found were around just how um for and this is specifically for um young black gay men in the South. I did a series of focus groups a couple of years ago, really examining this very question about, you know, so what are some of the perceptions and attitudes about PrEP? Um, and what came out of it was that, you know, there is definitely very high awareness, at least in these focus groups were done back in 2019. So a couple of years ago, um, and pretty much universally, most people had heard of PrEP or knew what it was. Um, but what was interesting was that there are a couple of things that, and these were not, uh, I, I, these were themes, but these were not sort of the, the top line overarching things. So I'll be very clear about that. But what we heard was that um, there is this issue of provider bias, right? And for um, young men in general, there is uh, kind of not necessarily a standard of seeking healthcare, number one, or having access to it. Um, but also, number two, this idea that you're taking something when you're not sick, right? And that came up a lot as something that was um, kind of just didn't click for people. So that was something that came up. Uh, and then two other things that were more minor, but I think are illustrative, right? So um, we heard a lot of people say, I went to my doctor and, you know, I asked about PrEP and my doctor said, I don't need it, right? Uh, and so there was this pushback that a lot of young Black gay men were getting from their providers about who needs to be on PrEP um, and the conversations around sexual health that were or were not happening within those providers' offices. Um, you know, that was pretty uh, telling. And two other things that came up that sort of uh, were interesting. One was around norms within a specific social network, right? And again, this didn't come up a lot, but it came up a couple of times where people said that oh, I talked to my friend who was on PrEP and he had a bad experience. And so therefore, like, I don't want to take it, right? Uh, and so even though those negative experiences of people using PrEP having side effects, um, those are were in the minority. They had an outsized impact on the perceptions of PrEP within that particular uh, social network. And the last thing that we heard, uh, and again, this was not a universally held perception, but it was something that was interesting and kind of made me think about what is the marketing that we do for PrEP? Uh, and again, I want to be very, put some clear brackets around this. This was not a university shared perspective, but um, this one young man told us that he didn't want to be on PrEP because um, it was free. You know, he was in a place that he was able to get it for free. And the reason being was that like, he knew, he's heard like, oh my God, HIV medication is so expensive. So if this is expensive, why are they making it free for someone like me, right? And it kind of, uh, it raised his uh, sort of medical distrust, right? And so, so those are some of the, you know, reasons that I, I've heard in my own research, but um, I think it's a multi kind of faceted issue in terms of why people aren't accessing it. But I think, again, it really does lean more into the, the challenges that we haven't made our system accessible, right? And so I think, Whenever we see these types of uh, inequities sort of replicate themselves, I always want to put the blame on the system and not on the population, right? It's like 
rather than ask like, why aren't these people, you know, taking this thing that we have, we have this great, you know, medication, why aren't you taking it? The question is like, why are we failed to make it easy for you to get it? Like, and that's really the way we have to think about it. Perfect. I just want to add on to, to what Justin um, said. Um, we, although in that study, there were uh, many same gender loving men who knew about PrEP, but I think when we look at communities of color overall, um, a lot of people don't know about PrEP. Uh, and then there's some misconceptions about PrEP and Justin covered this this earlier, but I really wanted to highlight something from the Georgia HIV uh, hotline uh, housed with uh, Aid Atlanta, uh, where Nicole uh, is the director. Um, and we had a call last summer with uh, the hotline about the number of calls coming into the hotline from uh, women across the state of Georgia about PrEP. And the number one question for, from those women was, is PrEP for women? And we know why they were asking that question because they're seeing the commercials from their favorite show and nothing about those commercials said, this is for you. So, you know, shout out to those women who were trying to be informed. And that led me to believe, as well as what came out in the Prep and Black America report, we have to increase our efforts in educating our community about the science so that people know what they have available, what options are available to them, but we got to present it in a way where people can understand it. Everything can't be academic. Um, and it's okay for settings like this, but for the general audience, for people to know this is an option for me, for me, the language has to be reflected of the people we're serving. And if I may chime in, I would I would agree with that as well. Because if if you remember um, with COVID, COVID-19, right? Um, many people of color were like, I'm not taking that vaccination, not gonna happen. You're not testing it out on me. So we, you know, many people waited until <laughs> to see what would happen. And many said, yep, not me. However, what was effective, what I saw more effective um, with, with um, selling the vaccination um, messaging was when people like them were saying the message. So you have to have a community response um, to, to these healthcare issues, you know, to these crises. Um, so to Jamie Hopkins' question, um, what are some of the socio-cultural um, uh, factors that may impact why somebody doesn't decide to um, get on PrEP? Or maybe they don't have anybody that looks like them that's on PrEP that can say, hey, this is my experience. It works. You know, you might have this issue or that issue. But we need some some messaging from the ground versus, uh, like to Alicia's point, uh, versus you know from this stamp, this vantage point of providers or whatever the case may be. I think it's it's most effective when it comes from somebody like you. Like I decided in in all um, transparency to get my vaccination. Once I talked to like five, six of my friends and said, how was it for you? What was the experience? What's the side effect? Oh, you didn't die. All right, I think I could do it. Perfect. So the next question that we had is very important, especially as we talk about the entire South and, and parts of Georgia as well. Do, your, do any of your organizations provide prep in rural areas? If so, how do you market the program in socially conservative areas? So uh, right hot off the press, uh, I don't know how many people have seen this, but in the last Georgia session, um, the Senate approved uh, prep uh, funding for a few rural community, uh, communities. And I think it's uh, Senate Bill 19. And there were uh, four, I believe, districts 
um, yes, four, uh, Rome, Gainesville, Waycross, and Athens uh, that were specifically listed uh, in this bill um, for a small amount of funding, I think $180,000 uh, for a prep program. And we know that those aren't metro areas, that these are more rural areas. Uh, and so I was really excited to see that occur. So, so to answer the question um, as an action, uh, I would reach out to those rural health districts and to see uh, from their marketing to how they're implementing PrEP to the education in some of Georgia's rural communities as well. So we have, in Atlanta has a healthcare center in Noonan, uh, Georgia, and it covers the 12th County LaGrange um, Public Health District 4. So many of those count five overlap with Metro Atlanta, but the remaining uh, seven actually are really in rural areas where um, our, many of our members are traveling huge distances. And so for the last couple of years, actually, the practice manager has been saying, you know, I think there's a need here for PrEP. Um, you know, uh, the, the partners of, you know, the members who are getting their health care at the center have, um, have been inquiring. And of course, our response has been, well, who pay for that? <laughs> So, you know, we're working on um, putting together some private funds, you know, in order to try to start uh, those services there. There, We can, of course, see people who have insurance, that's not an issue, um, but making sure that we can balance the capacity of providers, right, to the patients that we already have in care for HIV, positive people, as well as um, ensuring that PrEP uh, people who might need PrEP can also get access to that service. The other thing that's interesting that maybe or other organizations might face too is you might be funded by the Ryan White program, which we are. We're fi uh, funded by the Ryan White program for that healthcare center. And I can't use Ryan White money for PrEP. I can't use the time and effort of my Ryan White providers, nurse, MAs, you know, all those folks to provide PrEP. So maybe a, a potential advocacy point might be Ryan White, HRSA, CDC, all y'all, can we just let us serve all the people that we need to serve uh, without having to say, well, these two people will serve by part A, these three will part B, these three will C, and these other people over here were CDC funded. If we really want to end the epidemic, we are going to have to have an integrated approach in reality versus on paper. Perfect, perfect. So we have another um, audience question. Um, Amanda Van Buren, she um, introduced herself. She says she's the policy advocacy and mobilization program organizer and associate with Sister Love here locally. Um, are there any models at the state, local or international global level that can serve as a foundation for our um, national prep program? I think that that's, uh, that's a great question and thank you for posing that. Um, I just wanna share just a few thoughts of, of what we already know. Um, so we know that the uh, Biden administration is proposing funding for a national prep program, 9.85, billion with a B um, over the next 10 years. And so there has been um, some movement, which is really exciting. I think, I think we, we froze. Yeah, I think we lost the connection. There she is. You're back. You're back. Oh, I was on a roll. I don't know. <laughs> we know you were. <laughs> I don't know what I what you heard. You were talking. I think the last thing you said you were talking about the Biden administration's plan and and the, the the price tag, and then you were going on from there. So, okay. So um, there's been 
some traction over the past uh, couple of weeks about the use of uh, some discretionary funds, like as a, a down payment or um, uh, as a part of this model, uh, so to speak, of what would a national prep program look like and the intent the the co-pays uh for uh the medication um and what it looks like for uh the promotion of a teleprep model uh as well now one of the things that nicole mentioned and um I'm gonna say it, Justin, you have to tell me if I shouldn't have said it after, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it. One of these models that uh, has been looked at is what would it look like uh, for Ryan White um, to play a major role in uh, uh, PrEP uh, having the prevention arm? And I'm not Sure, I'm completely sold on that, uh, to be honest. But but it is exciting to know that there's movement for the possibility of a national prep program uh, within the year. Okay, perfect. So now um, the final um, one of the final Q and A questions. Then we'll actually transition to um, call and answer. I mean, um, call to action. So this question uh, from our counterpart at Xavier is, what role can education and awareness campaigns play in enhancing PrEP policy in the South? How can we effectively disseminate accurate information about PrEP to healthcare providers, communities, and individuals who are at risk? If, if I may, I'll go first. Um, I think um, public health messaging has um, honestly been watered down quite a bit, at, at least based on some of the stuff that I've been seeing or, or not seeing, honestly. Um, I, I personally, I haven't felt like we've done a lot, as much as we could as a state in terms of public messaging about PrEP and PEP and even about HIV, HIV treatment, STD, STD treatment. Um, but I do believe that because we are in an age of um, instant information, instant information, TikTok, you know, I think we have to have those type, we have to re-evaluate uh, the, the methodology by which we, we give those, these types of messages. So uh, whether it's use of TikTok or quick things, Instagram, you know, things that are very quick that people can catch on to and hear quickly, because honestly, I don't know anybody uh, who's necessarily looking up and looking at a billboard anymore, pamphlets, you know, people barely read, you know, um, read anything uh, nowadays, and especially the targeted population that we have, we have to adjust our messaging strategies, uh, I believe. Um, so yes, I think education is important, but it can't be education in the same way that we've been doing it. We have to shift our uh, the way that we've been messaging to folk. We have to take into account the age groups that are impacted and then have customized messaging based on those different age groups uh, because somebody that might be 60 something and at risk might not necessarily be on TikTok or Facebook. So you might need the more traditional way. And the other thing I want to highlight again is what I said earlier, which is the use of community, I'm gonna call them ambassadors. You know, and I know there's a term community health workers, kind of similar, but some community ambassadors that can take messages to the street, people who are trusted already, trusted community influencers in respective communities. Uh, and kind of do it the old fashioned way, you know, talking to folk, meeting with people during town halls, getting people collected together, um, whether that's um, through uh, innovative types of um, strategies, as well as using some old school strategies as well. I think it, we, we got to use all of the tools <laughs> in the toolbox. But I do believe for especially the younger folk that we see, um, they're quick on the messaging. They need it quick. They need it, you know, instantly. And 
So I think we need to look at some different ways of doing it, um, particularly with that age group. But yes, I would say yes, education, information is definitely needed. I think it's also important that we take a closer look at the language that we use for the messaging. Um, we uh, use a term in public health and I get it in our space um, when we use the term risk. But when we're talking to the public, um, choosing alternative language such as uh, helping folks assess, is this a prevention tool you need or not? Um, PrEP isn't for everybody, but it is for somebody. And unfortunately, as we looked at the data that Justin showed, there are a lot of some bodies that don't know <laughs> that it's for them. And so changing that language um, to eliminate the stigma is gonna be a big first step uh, for us. The other thing I would add to what Nicole and Alicia have also mentioned is that it's also really important to have messages that are focused on our healthcare workforce, right? So I think there has to be messaging that goes out to our general community and the folks that, that, that could benefit from PrEP. Um, and those need to look different in the ways that Nicole and Alicia have already offered. Um, the only thing I would maybe say in on top of that is that I think it also has to be in a way that we bring it into uh, popular culture in a little bit uh, broader way. You know, I feel like, you know, I'm an 80s kid. So like, you know, we always had after school specials and, you know, HIV was just part of the general <clears throat> cultural ethos. You know, you had songs like waterfalls, like you had things where people were having a conversation about HIV that wasn't just us that work in public health, right? And we have to kind of redo that part because I think that's how we reach out to more people. So, so not just sort of the public health messaging, but really like what happens within popular culture such that this becomes something that becomes a, a topic of conversation a lar in a larger way. And I know that people are working on that. Uh, but the second piece is really getting the healthcare system uh, together. Um, and there are models and things that work in that domain. So. Um, there's a process called academic detailing where uh, healthcare providers basically train each other on new techniques. Or, and in, in this case, it's not that new, but um, we know that uh, when um, Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, when he was in New York City, he implemented you know, academic detailing for, uh, for PrEP for uh, primary care providers within New York City. And you know they had about a 12% jump in the number of PrEP prescriptions after that was done, right? So these types of interventions on the healthcare system, we know that those also work. Um, and so we have to make sure we're doing that as well, because again, we don't, given that PrEP is not an over-the-counter uh, medication, and I don't think anyone's really advocating for that, because you have to go to a provider to access it, we don't want to ever have a situation where the provider actually is the problem with you getting your PrEP. And, and for too many, uh, particularly black and brown folks, that is the barrier. So we have to also make sure that when someone presents and they say, I'm ready, I made the decision, I'm here and I want PrEP, that the response of the provider is that, no, why do you need that, right? Um, and so that's where that academic detailing piece comes in. And so trying to figure out uh, ways to really scale that up so that we create a system that's ready for you know, all the folks that we're gonna try to generate that demand from with our cultural interventions and our, uh, you know, our TikToks and all that kind of stuff, right? So we wanna make sure that if someone has made the decision that they'd like to be on PrEP, that that process is as seamless um, from you know, them coming into the provider to them getting the medication and then staying on it, right? So I think that's the other thing we don't necessarily always talk about, right? Where, you know, once people get on PrEP, you know, um, and again, there are seasons of time where you might benefit from PrEP more or less, right? And so you can sort of make that decision to kind of go on and off, but sometimes people uh, fall off of taking PrEP for reasons that aren't really related to that, right? And so how do we make sure that the system is set up in such a way that if someone has made the decision to be on PrEP, and if they want to persist on that, that we have um, something that's in place that supports them to kind of maintain that decision. Thank you all. We have one last question um, in our few remaining minutes. 
What is one final thought and or call to action that you would like to leave with our audience today? We can begin with whoever would like to start. Uh, Leisha? Um, last year when we did our first prep uh, in Black America Summit, uh, I made a statement and I still stand behind it that we have all the tools we need right now. Uh, May 31st, 2023, to end the HIV epidemic. So if we have the tools, but we're not seeing the populations that need those tools the most benefiting from it, the question now has to be a personal question. What will you do, right, to ensure that folks in these communities are benefiting from those tools. So that, that would be my thought. And also call to action, take self inventory. What's my role? What can I contribute to getting to the end of this epidemic? Thank you. Um, just, or Nicole, sorry. We'll go with Nicole, <laughs> well, you first. sorry. Uh, uh, final thought. Uh, first off, again, just wanted to um, thank Morehouse uh, for having this forum. I think it's a forum uh, and conversation that we need to continue to have, uh, as Justin talked about, not only within the healthcare system itself, right, the healthcare workforce, um, as well as in the general community. So I would say that, yes, we, we need to continue to um, educate ourselves, educate our workforce, um, but also we need to find a way, and I, I honestly can't tell you that I know the best way to do that, is how do we educate the non-traditional HIV STD workforces, right? So healthcare workforces, your FQHCs, your community health um, centers, whose focus might not be um, HIV, um, or even STD or prevention kind of work. But how do we bring more, more, it, more um, entities into the fold? Uh, I think we continue to try to do it all on our own because honestly, people in the HIV field are very overly ambitious people. Like, look to the left and look down. You know, in my boxes, Leisha, Justin, and all of y'all in the boxes. But we can't tackle this situation all on our own. So we have to, to we have to think about inviting the unusual suspects to the table, those who are non-traditional HIV providers but provide healthcare services for folk who are the same people that we're serving, have the same issues, health disparities, same challenges. Um, I think we need to bring them to the table. So that 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 would probably be my last um, thoughts. Thank you again for, for having me. Thank you. And last, Justin? Yeah, I just also wanna echo my appreciation for the invitation to uh, be in conversation with two folks that I look at as public health superheroes. So it's really an honor to share the virtual stage with Nicole and with Lisha. Um, so just really appreciate that time. I would just build on what Nicole offered as far as in order for us to really end the HIV epidemic, it has to be an intentionally intersectional movement where, um, you know, we have to do the work of reaching out to other movements for justice, right? Um, I think that's sort of the root of HIV in some ways. The, you know, it started as a movement, right? And it still is in some ways, but I think, you know, we become uh, sort of HIV ink in a lot of ways. Um, but I think we have to kind of return to our sort of grassroots origin, right? Uh, because I think that's what we need in order to build the power to, to be able to make the changes that we desire, right? Um, it's not going to just be uh, a win for public health because HIV isn't just a public health issue, right? Um, and so I think trying to make sure that other movements that are fighting for justice and liberation also see us as a part of that conversation and that we, you know, invite them to our tables and we also go to theirs, right? Um, and I think that's how we create the win um, that we want. And so 
my call to action is, you know, as individuals, like, how are you having conversations about HIV with people that don't work in public health, right? Um, you know, are you talking to your, your community, to your family, um, to your other friends that don't work in the space about what it is that you do every day, right? Because um, I, even in my own work, like, I feel like I'm always surprised that when people, you know, know what I do, they'll come with me lots of questions. And those are, you know, open up possibilities, right? And for connections with other types of work that people are doing. So I think of all of us, um, you know, sort of got out of our, you know, public health echo chamber and did have just basic conversations with people that we're in community with that don't work in the space. I think that would be transformative. And that's something that we can all do in addition to all the other type of political advocacy that I think is also, um, you know, a part of what we must do if we're going to be able to end the HIV epidemic in the United States. Wonderful. Well, thank you to all three of our panelists for sharing your expertise and your call to action. Um, we greatly appreciate your joining us today and, and speaking with us. And I'm going to hand it over to Therese to close. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, um, to all of our great and astounding panelists. We are so appreciative, appreciative of you sharing your knowledge and your wisdom today. Thank you, especially to our audience members who joined us today, our sponsor, uh, Gilead Sciences, everyone in the land of Zoom on today. Um, I just want to remind everyone that we do have another upcoming um, webinar that we would love for you to participate in. It's going to be on August the 16th. Same time, same place. We'll make sure to send out the links. We will also have a survey that we would like you to complete as well, just to help us to make sure that we are answering all of the questions that you have. And it can also help us to inform what we're doing more uh, for our brothers and our sisters um, living with um, HIV. So we really want you to fill out that survey so that we can make sure to connect with you. And we want to continue to advance uh, health equity for people living with HIV. So again, thank you so very much all for um, being with us. We'll make sure that the link is posted on our website. Thank you again, panelists. Thank you, moderators. Have a great day.